Hi. Um, I am Kelly Coleman, it's true. And um, when I first heard the theme for this forum was open doors, I spent some time kind of contemplating that. And I do this funny thing when I think deeply about something. I stick this key on my nose and I spin it around and I stare up into space. And, and then I had this very interesting cross-eyed aha moment that I, I wear these keys. I wear three keys. Uh, they each have a word engraved on them. And they are possibility, inspire, and faith. And I wear them because I have a tendency of kind of um, locking myself into some ideas. And uh, some people may call it stubborn. I call it other things. Um, and I take comfort in the fact that the, the keys kind of empower me um, to know that if I lock myself into something, that, that maybe I have the power to unlock myself out of something. Um, I also realized that I was raised by a proverbial locksmith. I was raised by a single mom most of my childhood. And she really, she dared disappointment to stop us from dreaming. And she looked and laughed in the face of impossible and said, I don't buy it. So that took me to thinking about the doors in my own life and thinking, OK, well, what's behind door number one? Well, what was behind door number one was everything and anything. It was limitless possibility, just unlimited possibility. It was, it was everything. When I was three, I was in the bath, and I was having a conversation with my mom. And she says it went something like this. Would you like some soap? And my reply was, no. And she said, why not? And I said, because there are children in Africa without clean water, and I have to help. And that kind of caught her off guard, and she scratched her head a little bit and went, really? Now, I have a four-year-old. And she has an imagination that goes beyond the walls of the universe, sometimes way beyond. And um, I, I, when I was contemplating this, I was thinking, wow, I need to take note of her declarations more seriously. Um, I'm struggling a little bit because she's making this new declaration of wanting to be Batman. Um, but I'm sort of marinating on it and allowing it to, to develop into the fact that maybe she's a superhero. The next door that I took a peek at was door number two. And what was behind it was inspiration. When I was a teenager, I was inspired by everything. If it was a cause that was worth fighting for, I would enlist. And my mom said that I was the kind of kid that had a soapbox glued to my feet which I'm sure made me just wonderful to live with. <laughs> um, but when I was 16 years old, a man froze to death outside of my mom's office, a homeless man. And our life changed. In the following two weeks after it happened, she raised a quarter of a million dollars worth of hats and jackets and winter clothing. And she went out every night on a hot chocolate truck to distribute the clothes to the homeless population. And one night, she came into my room to kiss me goodnight, and she sat down on my bed, and she told me something that inspires me to this day and every day since. She said, terrible things happen in the world. And we stop and we say, oh, that's horrible. Someone should do something about that. But the question you have to ask yourself is, who is that someone if it isn't me? Which takes me to door number three. And what was behind door number three was really the birth of Save the Rain. Um, my mom went to a party. She met this man. And a couple of weeks later, his name is Jack. A couple of weeks later, Jack came to family dinner. And around my parents' dining room table, he told us the details of his recent trip to Kenya and the details of the global water crisis. Now, I come from a fantastic family of criers. And we were bawling. And the Kleenex was flowing. 
And the most amazing thing happened. This spontaneous, compassionate moment ignited. And so did our accountability. And once we committed to being a part of the solution to this colossal problem, all these doors started to open. I went to go register Save the Rain as a nonprofit organization with the IRS. They told me it would take two years. It took a couple of months. I went to a conference. I met a woman. She said, oh, you do rainwater harvesting. That's fantastic. I just got a letter from a community of farmers in Tanzania, and they said if they could have anything in the world, they would want a rainwater harvesting system. And I'm wondering if you could come with me in three months and help build it. And I said, of course. And I'm thinking, my god, we don't know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> and she said, great. And so I went home and thought, OK, now what do we do? So we went back to my mom's dining room table, everybody with an address book in hand. And we wrote a letter to all of our friends and family, asking them to have faith in us and to help us help other people. And five weeks later, we were on a plane and on our way to Tanzania. And since then, that will be 10 years ago in January, since then, we have helped over a quarter of a million people get access to clean water all by harvesting the rain. And the man who wrote the letter asking for that rainwater harvesting system for that farming community, he's my co-director. And by reaching out, and asking for help to open up doors in his own life, he opened up doors for a nation. So I think before we start to look at open doors, we kind of have to look at why are the doors closed? And the one thing that lack of clean water does is it shuts everything down. It locks everything away. I'd like you to take a minute to count out loud to eight with me. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Somewhere in the world, someone's just died from a global water crisis. Every day, 10,000 kids will lose their lives from lack of clean drinking water. And in the next seven years, it's estimated that the number's going to total out at 135 million people. Water is life. And when the access to clean water is compromised, your survival becomes an everyday confrontation. It affects education. Now, we don't tend to bring buckets to school. We bring backpacks. But in developing countries where water is scarce, kids bring buckets to school. And every day, they are forced to leave the classroom to go and search for water for their school sanitation and drinking water needs. Now, the communities that we work with and interview Kids are losing three to four months of class time searching for water just for the school, let alone what they've got to do for their own families. Water affects health. Now, we've all had the stomach flu, and some of us had the unfortunate experience of having food poisoning. And it doesn't feel good. But the truth is, is drinking dirty water every day feels like you're living with the stomach flu or food poisoning every day for the rest of your life. Now, the question I get asked most often is, why don't people boil water? Well, if you were walking four to six hours a day to find one five-gallon bucket of water, and you had to boil it to clean it, you would lose 50% of it to evaporation, which means you'd need to find eight to 12 hours in the same day to get that same five gallons. So about 90% of the people that we interview and that are recipients of the work do not boil water before consumption, obviously pre the project, um, because they don't have time. There just isn't enough hours in the day. Water affects gender issues. Now, as women and girls reaching maturity, we need access to a bathroom once a month at minimum. And Latrine pits and bathrooms, they're not available at educational institutions in developing countries because there isn't the water to sustain them. Which means that biology is dictating what happens to girls in regards to education. And generally what happens is on the onslaught of puberty, girls are denied an education 
and condemned to being a water walker for their community and for their family. So at 12 years old, boom, boom, that's it. Now, very few people make the correlation between water and the transmission of HIV and AIDS, but there's a direct correlation. There is a horrible misconception in the developing world that if you have a physical relationship with a virgin, you can cure yourself of AIDS. Women and children are responsible for water collection, and they do it well before dawn and long after dusk, and they go to remote areas where predators hang out and wait. And the unfortunate part is, is child rape is often how the disease is transmitted and not a punishable crime in some countries. So the question is, is why does the global water crisis exist? Does it exist because only 1% of the world's water is available for human consumption and we've polluted, unfortunately, half of it? Or does it exist because we've got some skewed perceptions around scarcity? So scarcity implies that there isn't enough and that we've got to manage those resources and determine who gets and who doesn't. But who makes those decisions and who benefits and who doesn't? We also have some pretty skewed perceptions around abundance. We make the correlation that abundance is about material wealth and luxury. But the truth is, is we've got to change all of that. Because today, the poorest Americans, those living below the poverty line, have more than the richest Americans did 100 years ago. 99% of them have electricity, clean drinking water, flushing toilets, and a refrigerator. 70% of them have air conditioning. And yet every day, women and children will spend 200 million hours walking for water that isn't even clean. Abundance is not about providing people with luxury. Abundance is about providing people with possibility, about opening those doors and giving the people the right to reach for their potential, regardless of economics and geography. So this is a typical picture of a successful well project. And I'm showing you this because most people ask, why do you do rainwater harvesting instead of digging wells? Unfortunately, this is the water quality test to that well. Now that well sits on a primary school next to a district hospital. Why does that exist? Governments in developing countries don't have the money to deal with sanitation infrastructure. It's not a priority. When you gotta go, you dig a hole in the ground and you go. When the rain comes, all of that bacteria is flushed down into the water table. Well, what about filtration, most people ask. Well, what does filtration require? Capital. You need money. And that doesn't exist in countries where the average income is a dollar a day. This is unfiltered rainwater from a carefully and carefully stored in a system that Save the Rain constructed. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what would you prefer to drink? And if it isn't good enough for all of us, it shouldn't be good enough for any of us. So this is what the organization does. We start by building a rainwater harvesting system on a primary school. Why a primary school? Well, when an inch of rain falls on 1,000 square feet, you can harvest 600 gallons of water. Primary school roofs are really big. It's great. Inch of rain, thousands of gallons. It's also the area that's most invested in in communities. And primary school education is considered free, so you're mandated to send your kid to school there. It's a safe place for women to come and collect water from, and it means that we are unlocking the door to education, and no kid is leaving that classroom to go and fetch water throughout the day. We also have a women's water initiative. And the Women's Water Initiative builds residential rainwater harvesting systems on homes. What does that do? Well, that shuts the need to walk down the need to walk for water altogether. You got it at home, just like that we do. Uh, it may look a little bit different, but this is a project that's done for women by women. Uh, the systems take six days to construct, and you are changing the path of women and girls and children for generations. We have a reforestation program with an amazing tree called the Moringa tree. 
It grows seven to 14 feet in the first year from seed, and the leaves are edible. And just 200 grams of boiled leaves is enough to provide a child with 100% of their daily nutritional values. It's also drought and flood tolerant, and if you stick, cut a limb off the tree and stick it in the ground, it'll repropagate a root system. It has a pod that if you crush it, you can extract an oil for cooking. If you dry the pulp, you can crush it into a powder, stick it into dirty water, and it'll naturally remove 90% of the bacteria from the water. And it is called mother's best friend. How very fitting. <laughs> so we also do a sustainable agriculture and permaculture design class that is mandatory for fifth and sixth graders. And we are doing it because we need to teach passive irrigation techniques and diversification in farming. And we need to give people the opportunity to harvest food on a regular basis. And why we do it with the fifth and sixth graders is because we are doing our best to ensure that the next generation of Tanzanians don't go hungry. So I want to close by sharing a Bantu proverb. It's a world called Ubuntu. And it means, I am because you are. And I think really what the word is, is about interconnectedness. It's about coming together and realizing that if there are those in scarcity, we are all in scarcity. But if we can be in abundance, we can all be in abundance. It also means that if you need a helping hand and I lend it to you, then one day when I need a helping hand, which I inevitably will in life, it will come back around to me as well. Now, in the time that I've presented to you, about 72 people have lost their lives due to lack of clean water unnecessarily. We can do something about that easily, whether it's that you turn the water off when you brush your teeth, you turn the lights off when you leave the room. You lend a hand to somebody in need. Don't only open the door to, to shut down scarcity. Kick the door in. You are unstoppable. And like my mom said, impossible? Don't buy into it. Thank you.